Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Are you glad you're here? Really glad you're here? I'm not hearing you. Are you glad you're here? Are you here with your Bibles? Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the Lord have laid something in my heart to talk to you about this evening. And I pray that the Spirit of God will give you understanding. He is the real teacher. So I pray that he will fill your heart with understanding tonight. And you will leave this place convinced of the knowledge of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm sharing with you on the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God. So recently there have been, um, if you remember from the beginning of this year, I've shared with you that the Lord told us that this year you will take on serpents. You will take on serpents. And Jesus actually said that when he said, This sign shall follow them that believe. He said, In my name they shall cast out devils. They will speak with new tongues. Then he says, They shall take up serpents. And I told you, taking up serpents is not picking up snakes. No. The Bible referred to certain people, human beings, as serpents. These are people who divert or twist the word of the Lord with the intention to deceive. As we approach the last days, we must be very careful of our faith because Satan is after your faith. Hallelujah. Satan is after your faith. I was studying um, one of those materials there are several of them. I was studying one of those materials um, about the beginning and was giving the story of Cain and Abel. And there, it clearly said that Cain actually gave himself to the devil because he would not walk perfectly by God's instructions. He was just hedging. Why must we, that, you know those kind of, must we, why must we go to church? Why must we? Now that's the personality of Cain. And that's because Satan had been tempting him. So he had the choice to keep the command of God or to follow the ways or the temptations of the devil. Praise God. So it was his choice and studying that material, I realized, you know, when both of them brought an offering to the Lord, I realized for the first time that God did not reject Cain's sacrifice because of the kind of sacrifice that Cain brought. No. God rejected Cain's sacrifice because Cain's ways were not perfect with the Lord. Are you listening to me? He was not obeying the instruction of the Lord. So he saw his brother giving sacrifice to God. He said, me too. I will give sacrifice to God. I mean, why are you bringing sacrifice to me? You don't follow my instructions. You don't follow the command I give to you. You don't follow my ways. Why should I accept your sacrifice? Because when you read from Genesis, God actually told him, he said, if you have done well, the doing well was not if you had brought, you know, by um, children's church, you know, they taught us that he brought some rotten pineapples and, you know, no, no, not really. It wasn't rotten. The Bible never said the, the, the content of the sacrifice was bad in itself. But it was the person bringing the sacrifice that God had a problem with. So God told him, if you have done well, wouldn't you have been accepted? Not wouldn't it have been accepted? So it is the person that God accepts, not the sacrifice. 
Are you hearing? You know, people have this mentality, I can live my life the way I want. I'll just give God tight and, and, and say that's what he wants. I'll give him what he wants. It's not every tight that God receives. Not every tithe he receives. Not every offering he receives. Don't think you, you please God by your offerings. No, it's your heart. He says, my son, give me your heart. It's your heart he's after. If your heart is not right with him, and then you bring an offering to him, your offering will stink. That's why Samuel told Saul, hey, to obey is better than sacrifice. I mean, what, what, what does that mean? Don't think God is moved by sacrifice. Because we bring sacrifice to him that he may instruct us. Are you following what I'm saying? We bring sacrifice to him that he may what? Instruct us. So if you will not follow the instruction of the Lord, why come to him then? It's a waste. And he considers it a waste. You're coming to drop your offerings before him, but then you're not willing to abide by the instructions he would give to you. So that's why God told him that sin is still lying at the door. God was literally telling you, see, because he was following the way of the devil, he was just following Satan. Remember, Satan was there from the Garden of Eden. He is the one that caused God to. He didn't disappear after that. He went after the children of Abraham, Adam and Eve. Are you following what I'm saying? He went after them. And he got a hold of Cain. But he couldn't penetrate Abel. And by the same instigation, see, when Satan starts with a man's life, the end is always death. Are you following what I'm saying? So he instigated Cain, kill your brother. Kill your brother. Praise God. Hallelujah. So we must be mindful. Be, be very mindful of your faith. God is interested in your faith. And your faith have everything to do with the way you live your life. If you don't have accurate knowledge of God, the way you live your life will not be accurate. And that means it will affect your faith. And, and we live in a world, like I was telling earlier, as we're approaching the last days, Satan is after your faith. He's after your accurate knowledge of the, law, of the word of God. He's after your accurate knowledge of the personality of God. You know, recently, there's been this talk, you know, about uh, whether God have ever appeared in person before. And then I see, I see people share with scriptures. And uh, you see, during the daily broadcast, I think a few days ago, I was explaining that there is a difference between a Bible teacher and a word teacher. They are not the same people. And many people don't know that. Are you getting what I'm saying? We have, the truth is we have a lot of Bible teachers, but we have very few word teachers. And most of the Bible teachers you have are not called, because not, not even most of the Bible teachers. There is nobody that God has called to be a Bible teacher. No one. God doesn't have such callings. See, my, my calling is I'm a teacher of the Bible. No, God has no such calling. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? All you need to be a Bible teacher is to be intelligent enough to read and understand and explain. So people who, um, once you're smart and then you know this world you don't even have to be super smart just be averagely smart because you carry the bible so people assume this role of if he's carrying the bible then he must be a special person and you get what i'm saying you get what i'm saying so you read and then you combine scriptures and then you bring it out and they're like whoa wow but to be a word teacher you have to be called you can never you can never wake up and say i want to teach god's word it's impossible because it takes an anointing to do that. Because a word teacher is not coming to teach what he knows. I need you to understand that. A word teacher, the same way a prophet works. A prophet, see, a prophet cannot prepare enough to say, I am now prepared, I'm going to minister. 
What is he preparing with? Are, are you getting what I'm saying? He is coming to speak the mind of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? He's coming to speak the mind of God. So which, which material does he want to now read? Are you understanding what I'm saying? He has to depend completely on God to come so that he will begin to prophesy accurately. Are you understanding what I'm saying? A prophet comes and he wants to tell you, you know, just like in the Bible, where the Bible spoke about prophet Agabus, that Agabus told them that um, a famine is going to come around the world. So which material do you want to read to go and prophesy that one? <laughs> Are you understand what I'm saying? What do you want to study? So you have to be in the presence of God. The same way a word teacher has to be in the presence of God. So that he, now what, what's the difference between a prophet and a word teacher? A prophet will prophesy and tell you, hey, this is the plan. A word teacher will explain the character, the nature of God's personality. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I hear what I'm saying. A, a what teacher will make you understand God. Now, why did I say God doesn't call anybody or he has never called anybody to be a Bible teacher? Because truth is because God did not write the Bible. I understand what I'm saying. He did not write the Bible. Understand what I mean? He did not write the Bible. You know, people just think that God sat down and told people, write. And then they started writing. And they wrote. Now, there are, there are instances God told people, write these things. Are you get what I'm saying? Write this. And when I say the Bible, I'm saying these 66 books is not God that sat down and said, okay, write you. Write Genesis. You. you write Exodus. You. You write. No. <laughs> Praise God. Understand that. That's why I always, always emphasize this for you to understand. It will help when you, when you study the scriptures. You know, the Bible is not the word of God. It's a compendium of testimonies of people who received the word of God, what they did with it, and what they became from it. I hear I'm, I'm, I'm putting all this foundation. As we go on, you'll begin to understand why I'm sharing these parts with you. Praise God. So the Bible is a true material, meaning everything written inside is true. Everything that happened, that is recorded, truly happened. There is no lie in it. But a lot of people, because they don't understand it, are you hearing what I'm saying? Because they don't understand it, misinterpret things and put up this attitude of it is written in the Bible. Like early 20s, you know. The Bible says money answereth all things. When we entered the 2020s, when there was an explosion of the prosperity gospel, oh, that was one scripture that was ringing in every Pentecostal church. Money answereth all things. And, and we had messages, we had sermons that, that showed you that man, money answereth all things because you, that's why you've got to have money. And we preach those messages. I preach those messages. <laughs> Praise God. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you know, that's why, that's why I always say when, when someone has been preaching the gospel for 20 years and then suddenly comes and say, I've realized I've been preaching the wrong thing. I suspect you. Deeply, I suspect you. I, it will be difficult for me to even trust you right now. 20 years. Not one year. I get what I'm saying. I've been in situations where I, I believe something and I, and I teach it. And the first time I taught it, I just felt a bit uncomfortable in my heart. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? Maybe I didn't check it out. And then another time I'm talking about it, as I say, the Holy Spirit comes and say, Oh God, I, that's not what I said. I you understand what I'm saying? That's not what I said. It will take only twice, only two times. And then the ones who say, hey, 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 that's not what I said. Go look at it very well. And I'll go look at it and say, yeah. <laughs> Praise God. I'm telling you the truth. So when someone has been preaching the same kind of thing for 10 years, 20 years, and then I'll wake up and say, I realize I've been preaching the wrong thing. No, it's better you tell us that, look, for the past 10 years, I've been disobeying God. 
I'll be, do you understand what I'm saying? But for you to say, I realize now that I've been preaching the wrong thing. I want to investigate what made you realize it now. I want to investigate. So we preached all those sermons. Money answered all things. But I tell you the truth. Anytime I say it, I feel a bit uncomfortable because I see that when we say money answered all things, we're almost equating money to God. So I had a problem with that. But then it, you see it in the Bible. <laughs> you see it in the Bible. So those are some of the things you're uncomfortable with. But yes, I know God wants us to prosper. But to say money answered all things, especially when you now understand the teachings of Jesus, it's until one day, I didn't hear this from someone, until one day the Holy Spirit spoke to me and says, look at that scripture very well. So I began to study on it. I took several translations and I began to look at it and I said, yay, this is false. Not just wrong, it's false. It's false. The Bible never said money answering all things. It never said so. It's King James that said money answering all things. But that's not what it meant. He was rebuking the princes of the day and saying to them that instead of them to do what is right, they sit down there eating and drinking and tell themselves, after all, money will answer for it all. Are you understand what I'm saying? Now, someone takes that line, money answered all things, and say, ah, no wonder. We must have money. You see, once your faith is on the wrong foundation, whatever you build on that thing, will come to naught. That's the reason when that prosperity gospel explosion came up, a lot of wrong things came into the church. Are you listening to me? So we must be careful. And how are we careful? Trust the Holy Spirit. Jesus left us with the Holy Spirit. I've always said this. Jesus left us with the Holy Spirit, not with the Bible. He did not leave us with the Bible. The Bible is a wonderful material. But if you take the Holy Spirit off it, you are dealing with a dangerous material. And that's why Paul said the letter what kills. It is the spirit that gives life. So remove the spirit from, now that's why when you hear me say, God did not call anybody to be a Bible teacher. Because most Bible teachers, you know, now understand this also, you know, a a what teacher will really help a Bible teacher. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And also, a Bible teacher will really help a word teacher. Am I confusing you? (laughs) Am I confusing you now? Now, let me explain. A word teacher doesn't necessarily have to be educated. A word teacher may not know how to speak English very well. A word teacher may not even know how to read and write. But because... He is anointed to teach the word of the Lord. He will accurately explain the word of the Lord to you. Now, when he finished teaching, you that is educated will carry your Bible and begin to cross-check the things he taught and you will be helped. You understand what I'm saying? You understand what I'm saying? Now, how will a a Bible teacher help a word teacher? Remember, I said that's if... He's not educated or, or, hear me, or he doesn't take time to study his Bible. Now, I know many people will not be happy with this. A word teacher does not necessarily have to be studying his Bible. I say many people will not be happy with this. Now, I study the Bible <laughs> very well. I, I hear what I'm saying. But understand, I'm telling you, these are things I have come to find out. A word teacher doesn't necessarily have to study his Bible. He doesn't necessarily have to know his Bible. Now you get what I'm saying? Now, remember I said he may not be educated. Right? So, if he's not educated, and then he now wants to carry Bible, it will cause trouble for him. Because the Bible can become his limitation. Especially... Because there are lots of wrong interpretations and information that are out there. A lot of things you believe were not what you read from the Bible. They were things people told you. For example, how many wise men went to visit Jesus? How many? How many? 
Three, right? Huh? Come on, be bold now. Three. Come on. Three, right? Now, where did you see that it was three? Some of you are, will be bold enough to say, I see the Bible now. There are three wise men. There were three wise men. They went to see Jesus. You will be so bold. You will argue it. You know, if you meet, let's say you now, you meet a Jehovah Witness. And, and, they, and they say, how many wives? They say, three. They say, yeah, they are not three. They say, ah, look, I know this one. <laughs> but where did you get it from? You were told. You were told. Book of Bible story, they drew the, drew the pictures, and they drew three of them on three camels. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Now, we think they are three because they brought three kinds of gifts. Gold, frankincense, and mares. So, so in our mind, we think one of them brought gold. The other one brought frankincense. The other one brought me. But the truth is, it's just telling the quality of gifts they brought. He didn't say there were three gifts. <laughs> gold is gold. Now, somebody can bring gold chain. Somebody can bring gold cup. And then the three of them could have brought gold. The three of them could have brought frankincense. Are you get what I'm saying? The three of them could have bought or, or. Now, like I said, did he say there were three? They could have been five. The Bible just said wise men from the east. Never said three. But somebody imagined they were three and passed that down to for many generations. We could argue it that they were three. Where's the foundation of that? It's not there. Now, you know the danger of that. The danger of that is when someone now increases in knowledge and now discovers that they were not three the person automatically begins to feel that something is wrong with the Bible. Do you understand what I'm saying? And then you find people who began to be enlightened and suddenly say they are leaving the church. People who grew up in church, suddenly they are enlightened. They say they are leaving the church. Now, now people began to entice them with knowledge. And somebody just throws a little thing to them. that said, you know, they are not three wise men. See, see, see. Say, hey, nobody told me this. Say, we have the lights in the light of truth. Yeah. <laughs> Are you listening to me? And the person say, hey, nobody has ever told me this. So maybe these people truly know better than we know. I, I like knowledge. Knowledge stimulates me. And then you begin to follow. Why? Because the foundation that was given you was faulty. And not because... God gave you a, a faulty foundation because you did not take time to build your foundation. Are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? Praise God. Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 23 and 24. Quickly. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Is this working? Oh, Likitabanda Grede Besha Katabanios. Okay, good. It says, give me New King James, please. New King James. It says, Thus says the Lord. Now, who's speaking here? Who's speaking here? Now, take note. When you're studying your Bible, take note of those things. Are you following what I'm saying? You say, thus says the Lord. So, whatever is going to come next is a quote from God. The person that wrote this is saying, I didn't write this by myself. I heard the Lord say this. So, I recorded this, right? Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his mind. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. So, God says, don't glory in this. So if you're mighty, don't glory because you're mighty. If you're rich, don't glory because you're rich. If you're wise, don't glory because you're wise. Next verse. It says, but let him who glories, glory in this, that he what? Understand and knows me, that I am a God, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight says the Lord. So God is saying anyone who wants to glory should glory in this. That he what? Understands and knows me. He says if you're wise 
don't glory in yourself that you're wise. If you're rich, don't glory that you are rich. If you're mighty, like Samson, <laughs> don't glory in your mind. If you want to glory, meaning until you enter this place, then you can start talking that you are somebody. Until you enter the understanding of God. He says, if you want to glory, glory in this, that you will understand and know me. Then he gives you an idea. He says that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness. You need to know him here. You need to know how he exercises loving kindness. Do you know what it is to exercise loving kindness? Huh? You don't know. <laughs> what, now let me break it down to you. You know what it means to exercise? What does it mean to exercise? Come on, talk to me. Exercise now, exercise. It's not Greek. <laughs> it's not a spiritual word. <laughs> Come, talk to me. Huh? Continuous exerting. Continuous what? Exertion. Are you getting what I'm saying? You are doing something. Say, I'm going for exercise, right? What are you talking about? You know, somebody can stand on one leg and like say, what are you doing? I'm doing exercise. You believe them, right? So what kind of exercise is this? I'm strengthening. So he's putting pressure, right? You go for exercise and then you're running, right? You're running. Say, what are you doing? I'm exercising. So I'm building. You, you, you get what I'm saying? I, I'm going for exercise. I'm swimming. You don't go for exercise in the pool and just hang in one place. And, and no, you don't do that. Praise <laughs> God. You, you, you keep saying, how far can I go, Right? How far can I go? So God says, one thing you need to know about me is I, one thing you need to know about me is what? I exercise loving kindness. Now, now what is loving kindness? Loving and showing kindness. I love to exercise it. So God is saying, I, look, I want to see people that are so tough to love and I want to see how far I can love them. Do you understand what I'm saying? You know, that's why when you start praying some prayer against your enemy, God is just looking at you. you see, it, it, that, those prayers are very difficult to be answered. So sometimes you say, how come wicked people live so long? Because God is like, using them for exercise. <laughs> He's using them for exercise. Say, how, how, you, you are saying, God, just kill them. Just, you know, just, God is like, how well can I have this person around me and still be me? You understand what I'm saying? Are you getting what I'm saying? How, how, how well can I have this person and still be me? Look at Satan. The Bible said the, the, the sons of God gather, Satan shows up. If you're the one in that meeting, if you're the one God says, stand by the door, hey, you will draw sword. <laughs> you will call it Jemichael. <laughs> Michael, this guy has come here. We cannot allow. No, see, even if, even if God will not talk, we are his sons. This is the we shall answer the enemy at the gate. This is the enemy. Let's answer him at the gate. But he's chosen, and God gives him assignments. <laughs> What's God doing? Exercising, loving. You think God hates the devil? But he has not changed God one bit. He has not changed God's plan one bit. I <laughs> get what I'm saying. So in the midst of the devil, God is still carrying out his plan, even using him to execute his plan. Can you, can you handle that as a person? That you know somebody hates you at your job. This person hates you. But you just tell yourself, you know what? I'll, I'll be me. <laughs> I'll be like my father. I will exercise loving kindness. I know you have the Holy Spirit to help you. The person just did something. You just heard yesterday afternoon that the person wrote something against you. And, and, and you're like, what, what kind of nonsense is that? You're so angry. And then the Lord says, see that shirt you just bought? You know, I'll give it to him. You say, what kind of rough place is that? Lord, now I'll obey you. Now I'll obey you. Oh, it's not fair. It's not fair. Okay, you carry it and you're going. Say, I want you to smile. Must I smile? If I don't want to see him, I'll just drop. He said, I want you to go to him and tell him that you love him. And that's what... Yeah. 
What's God doing? He's teaching you about himself. He wants you to, to exercise loving kindness. Say, me, I cannot handle that too. I cannot live with that kind of a person. No. Ah. <laughs> God has been living with the devil. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? He said, I love to what? Exercise loving kindness. What next does he love to exercise? Church. That's another. You see, each word I can teach for weeks on each of this. Judgment and righteousness. Idiot. The most difficult. You see, if you are said in heaven, you are saying they be, their head is correct in heaven. But it says, wait, in the earth. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Praise God. Now, now, several times from creation, after God made the heavens and the earth, and then he made man. And the Bible talked about Adam and Eve, that the voice of God came walking in the garden, right? In the cool of the day. So Adam and Eve, they knew when God shows up. You get to answer. So God visits them. Now you remember in Hebrews, in the book of Psalms also, you find it. He, he asked that question. He said, what is, the angels actually were literally wondering. He said, what is man? that you are mindful of him, and the son of man, that you visit him. Now, it is an amazing thing to God. You know, I heard a preacher talking on national TV that God has never appeared before. You know, like, I don't understand. This one, you don't even need the knowledge of God, just the knowledge of Bible. <laughs> Praise God. But you see, when they begin to explain, they think they are intelligent. But they are not. That's what I was explaining to you. Their knowledge of the Bible or their perceived knowledge of the Bible begins to confuse their minds. I'm telling you the truth. The Bible says, and that was spoken by revelation. They ask the question, what is man that God is mindful of him? And the son of man that you do visit him. So they know that God visits man. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now, angels are sent to men. Are you getting what I'm saying? But beyond angels being sent to men, the angels have noticed that God visits man. Like, we don't understand. Are you listening to what I'm saying? We don't understand. We are here. We are here. Any assignments you want, send us, we go. But you know, God... God like, look, I, I'm going to visit Abraham. <laughs> and it, it shows up. And when you read scriptures, read Genesis, now because of time, maybe you should read Genesis chapter 12. Let me show you. <coughs> Genesis chapter 12 from verse 7. Verse 7. Then the Lord did what? appeared to Abraham. Now, now there are places you say then the Lord said to Abraham, right? But here he says, then the Lord did what? Appeared to Abraham and said. So Abraham had an encounter with God. And this was not a dream. There were times Abraham had a dream and in the dream God appeared to him. It was stated there that God appeared to him in a dream. And you understand what I'm saying? But this, I think that, that's Genesis 15. It clearly says that God appeared to Abraham in a dream. But this one says, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said. So Abraham was just moving and God showed up and he re recognized God. Now that's the reason, see, Abraham knew God so well. No wonder the Bible calls him the friend of God. Praise God. And there is something you must understand. Abraham had several physical encounters with God, right? But in all those encounters, it was not the same face. It was not the same physical figure that he saw. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So this was one. And the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to your descendants, I will give this land and they shall build me. And there he built an altar unto the Lord who appeared to him. He said, no, this, this is the one. Now I know you see where Jacob lands to build altars to. <laughs> Are you getting what I'm saying? Are you understanding what I'm saying? He landed from his grandpa. So Abraham said, ah, no, no, no. This is a special place. 
Uh, I'll build an altar here. <laughs> Praise God. Now let's go to chapter 18. Or oh, give me 17. 17 verse 1. Chapter 17. Chapter 17. Genesis 17. You have to be fast with this thing. Watch. When Abraham was what? 99 years old. 99 years old. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am almighty God. See another appearance. He said the Lord what? Appeared to Abraham and said. Now he didn't tell us what form he appeared. He just said God appeared to Abraham. And then they had a very lengthy conversation in this place. And you understand what I'm saying? Now it was here God spoke to him about circumcision, right? And, um, and, and he, he, that's the reason why immediately God finished speaking to him. The guy got up, carried knife. <laughs> <laughs> this was not dream. This was not. This was not speculation. This is we had. A, I had a conversation with God, and God said, "This is a covenant that I'm cutting with you." Say yes, sir. And so immediately God left. He said, "All right, carry the knife. All of you male, gather here." <laughs> I started circumcising them. Now give me chapter eighteen, verse one. Chapter eighteen. Then watch this now. I love this one. Then the Lord appeared to him by the terrible tree in Mamre as he was sitting in the tent. Now, when you study this just before then, right? Lot, the Lord, when him and Lot separated, right? Now, you know what caused the strife between him and Lot. And he told Lot, move this way. And Lot moved. And Abraham now moved. If you study, Abraham moved to live in Mamre. That's where he went to settle. After Lot departed, he now moved to settle in Mamre. And then the next, the next story we're reading is God appeared to him there. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? So I'm like, okay, maybe God wanted him to go and align himself to the place he's going to walk by. That's another day stop. Then the Lord appeared to him by the terrible tree of memory as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the, the next verse. So he lifted up his eyes. Now watch. He lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, three men standing, were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground. Next verse. And said, my Lord, if I have found grace. Now, listen. He saw three men standing, right? The moment he saw them. Remember, this guy has had encounters before. The moment he saw them, he ran to them and said, hey, my Lord. If I have found grace, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Uh -huh. Next verse. Please let a little water be brought and washed and wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree. Next verse. And I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your heart. After that, you may pass by. Inasmuch as you have come to your servant, they said, do as you have said. And God didn't come to his house. He was relaxing outside his house. And he saw these three men just standing. Now, he knew that these were not normal men. He didn't say he saw three men coming. He just saw three men standing. He's had these encounters before. So he doesn't see God coming from far and just strolling and coming. Do you understand what I'm saying? He might be this and he just turned and like, okay. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? And so when he saw this, he said, ah! Let me take advantage of this. Hey, look, you can't be passing by. Because they, they didn't do like they were even coming to his house. But he said, nah, 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 nah. You must eat. <laughs> next verse. And he said, do as you have said. Give me the next verse. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal. Knead it and make cake. Uh-huh. And Abraham ran to the head, took, the guy was just running here, he told Sarah, look, make something. He ran to his cattle, <laughs> ran to the head, took a tender and good calf, gave it to the young man, and he hastened to prepare it. And he waited, he roasted that goods. Next verse. 
So he took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree as they ate. I get what I'm saying. As they what? Ate. Next verse. Then they said to him, Where is Sarah after eating? You know? <laughs> Where is Sarah, your wife? So he said, Here in the tent. Let's go on. And he said, I will. He wasn't quoting. He wasn't quoting. And this is one of the three men. Watch this. And he said, No, give me the, give me the verse before that. I want to watch something. The last part of verse 9. They said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? They said to him. They say he said to him. They said to him, Where is Sarah? Now give me the next verse. So he said, Where is Sarah? They said, Where is Sarah, your wife? So she's in the tent. And he said, I. Now say we. He said we. He said, I. So one of them was speaking now. Are you following me? I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was, I mean, this is, yeah, look. <laughs> I don't know if other times God used to appear to him without Sarah. You get what I'm saying? But Abraham would come home and say, I met God today. And see what he said. See what he yeah. Then suddenly, I believe when he went into the tent, he just said, make me say, ah, I think this is God. <laughs> so this man was busy <laughs> by the door. <laughs> like, okay, what are they discussing? <laughs> what are they talking about? So since Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Next verse. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Go on. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself. She didn't laugh out. I get what I'm saying. Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have, a, have pleasure? My Lord being old also. See, her problem was not even the getting pregnant. Say, how? <laughs> how? How will it happen? <laughs> Praise God. Next verse. And the Lord, watch. And the Lord. Now you see. Before now, I say he. Now he now goes deeper. And, and look at what he is. Capital L-O-R-D. And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Saying, shall I surely bear a child since I am old? This woman said it in her heart. And remember, no angel has the capacity to know what is in your heart. They don't. They don't. So this was not an angel. Are you understanding what I'm saying? He told her. He says, why did Sarah laugh? Saying, shall I have, you know, and since I'm old. Next verse. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life. And Sarah shall have a son. Next verse. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh. But she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. See, we make an argue with God. <laughs> Give it to them. <laughs> Give it to them. Face to face like this, like no. <laughs> I mean, she knew she laughed. But now she was standing on the fact that he couldn't have heard me laugh because I did not laugh. <laughs> so I can defend myself because truly, where is the evidence? <laughs> Praise God. He said, because she was afraid. He said, no. See, God said, but. And he said, no, you did laugh. I know where I'm talking from. <laughs> Here's the next verse. Then the men rose from there and looked towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them and sent them on their way. Go on. Since, no, no, no. 17. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Now you understand that these three men that came to see Abraham... One of them was the Lord. I get what I'm saying. One of them was the Lord. Now, if you read this into the next chapter, now you see this end by God saying, Look, Abraham, I'm going to Sodom and I'm going to destroy Sodom. That's what he said. He said, This is what I'm going to do. So Abraham began to argue and negotiate with God. Look, look. And God said, Okay, if I see. 
Now, the kind of authority he was speaking by, he was not sent. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. So, there is no one that can argue that this was not the Lord. There is nobody that can say this was an angel. No angel has that right. God has said, go and destroy something. You will not come and say, okay, if we see, we will not. Eh? Who gave you that authority? It's only the Lord himself that can consider. Now, when you read the next chapter, let me just explain that. Lot was sitting by the gate of Sodom, and he saw how many men? Two men. Three men left Abraham, and they said they are going to Sodom. Are you following me? But Lot, by the time they got to Sodom, only two men got to Sodom. And by the time they got to Sodom, we realized that they are angels. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the Lord was no more with them. But he told Abraham, say, I am going to Sodom. Abraham saw three men, right? And he says, I am going to Sodom. But by the time they got to Sodom, only two men showed up in Sodom. Did the Lord disappear? No, I wish I can read it because of time. When, when they began to tell Lot, because now Lot convinced them he had learned from his uncle. When you see strangers, be smart, it might be the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> you get what I'm saying? So, Lot saw these men. Knowing how the city was, he said, no. Hey, guys, look, come and stay in my house. They said, no, we'll stay on the street. Eh? On the street, no. He insisted and said, okay, we'll oblige you. And they went to stay in his house. He made them food. You know the story. The people of Sodom came and said, hey, Lot, we saw some men in your house. Bring them out. Bring them out. <clears throat> and Lot tried to negotiate. He said, no. The men pulled Lot back. And caused the men to be blind. And once the men became blind, they told Lord, do you have anybody else in this place? Go and get them out of here now because we are going to burn down this city. And Lot went to his in-laws. He had daughters that were married. He had daughters, two daughters in his house that were not married. Yet he had daughters that were married to men of Sodom. The Bible says he went to his son-in-laws and said, hey guys, look, pack your things. Leave this city now. The Bible said they laughed at him. He was busy. The angels dragged him. They says, oh, yeah, leave, carry here. Guess what the Babylonians said? Oh, oh. Ah, le basu brede. So Lot went out and spoke to his son-in-laws who had married his daughters and said, get up, get out of here for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his, but to his son-in-laws, he seemed to be joking. Next verse. When the morning dawned, the angels, watch this, the angels urged Lord, say, hurry, saying, rise, arise, take your wife and your two sons and who were here. Let's wake up. Next verse, next verse, next verse. Quickly, quickly. And while he lingered, he was dragging his feet. The men took hold of his hand, his wife, his wife's hand and the hands of his two daughters. The Lord being merciful to him. Was the Lord there or not? Was the Lord there or not? He was there, but nobody could see him. But when he showed up to Abraham, Abraham saw him. Are you listening to me? Abraham saw him. Abraham sat with him. Abraham ate with him. Now they left Abraham and they went to Sodom. Suddenly they can only see two. Are you, are you following what I'm saying? Yet he was there. So when all this hurry was going on, the Lord was the one giving the instructions. So when Abraham, it was the Lord that told the angels, grab them. <laughs> Are you understand? That's why he had to say, he said, the Lord be merciful to him. And they brought them out. Next verse, watch. Next verse. And it came to pass when he, that he said, um, so it came to pass when they had brought them out that he said, are you following? That he said, escape for your life. Don't look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plane. Just go. Next verse. So Lord said to them, please, no, my Lord. Uh -huh. Indeed now, he was trying to negotiate. Next verse. Give me the next verse. Next verse. And he said to him, see, I have found favor 
I have favored you concerning this thing also, in that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. Uh -huh. Next verse. Hurry, escape, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Now you see, he began, there were two, but one was now, it's now the one person that was speaking. Are you understand what I'm saying? So the Lord was in their midst. He didn't go back to heaven. Because this was why he came down in the first place. He stopped by to see Abraham and bless Abraham. But he was coming to finish this city. And he finished the work. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Now, this was Abraham's journey. Now, you will get to Moses. Moses was one man that had wonderful encounters with God. But God never appeared to Moses. Have you ever thought about that? God never appeared to Moses. The Bible says God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, so he didn't see anybody. He saw a bush burning, right? He saw fire, but the bush was not burning. So he wondered what's going on here. So as he approached to look at what's going on here, the voice of God came to him, right? And God began to instruct him. And several times, God will call him, come up to the mountain. He will come up to the mountain. There will be thunders and, and things. Then he will hear a voice. But Moses knew about Abraham's stories. Are you getting what I'm saying? Moses knew about Abraham's stories. So he began to wonder, why is God always, why, why can't I experience God the same way Abraham experienced God? I, I mean, I, I know God. It's not like I don't know. I know God is there, but why is he doing this thing to me? So one time he said, okay, Lord, show me. I want to see you. Chapter 33, book of Exodus. He said, show me your glory. He got to that voice and said, maybe I should ask. You know, if I don't ask now, he'll say, I didn't ask. He said, show me your glory. And God said, ah, okay, this is what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to pass by a cliff. And when I'm passing there, you're going to come and hide you. You will not see my face. Because if you see my face, you will die. <laughs> no one will see my, can see my face and leave. But then I'm going to pass. And then I'll let you see my back. The funny thing is, he still didn't see anything. Because when he came to pass, Moses ran and went to hide himself. And God was only talking. The same thing God has been doing to him. The Lord, merciful. The Lord. <laughs> That's all he heard. And God has finished passing like, ah, so where is he? Do you know why God revealed himself to Abraham and didn't reveal himself to Moses? No, despite the fact that Moses had to depend on him step by step for every instruction. He gave Moses commandment. I'll tell you the reason. Abraham was working with God as a solo person. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Moses is going to lead a whole nation. So his revelation about God matters a lot. So truly, God had to show himself to Moses the real way he loves to show himself, which is his word. Are you getting what I'm saying? Because if Moses had seen a figure... It is that figure he would want to communicate to the people. And God cannot appear to everybody like that. So it will be confusing for Moses to be telling the children of Israel that God came to me and this is how he is. Are you understanding what I'm saying? This is how he is. And then everybody will be like, eh, but, but we didn't see him. You're deceiving us. And remember, when they were on the mountain, God gave Moses strict instruction. He says, Moses, remember, the day I appeared to you, you never saw any similitude. Are you getting what I'm saying? God told him, say, you never saw anything. Therefore, don't ever make any image that is like me. So God was intentional. He knew what he was doing. If God had appeared the way this children of Israel is, you just describe the person you saw. They will carve it out for you. I said, didn't Moses say he had some white jaws and, and they will carve it out? I said, Moses, behold what you described for us. <laughs> this is the God that you described for us. Hey, now let him lead us. So God was so intentional about not showing up physically to Moses. Hey, well, guess what? He showed up to Joshua. 
when they were about to enter Jericho. While they were thinking of how to enter Jericho, the Bible says um, Joshua looked and he saw a man standing with a sword drawn. And Joshua ran to him and said, are you, now, let, give me that scripture. Joshua, Joshua chapter 6, right? Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. Joshua chapter 5. Mako sabre de kila haski de brando kosaligra hataikeba. And it came to pass when, verse 13, right? And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked. And behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. He saw what? A man. This was not a dream, right? He saw a man. Okay. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? <laughs> now, you think when God shows everywhere, you should be shaking. But he saw this man. He ran to him and said, Are you for us or for our adversaries? Next verse. Quickly now, quickly now. So he said, no, but as the commander of the army of the Lord. Now, now you see how he introduced himself. As the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua lifted up his face to the earth and worshipped. And he said to him, what does my Lord say to his servants? Now take note, angels never receive worship. Angels, they cannot receive worship. Eh, they actually want to kill us. <laughs> Right? <clears throat> Times that men have tried to worship, say, see that you don't do that. Don't. Right? Next verse. <clears throat> um, um, and then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Next verse. Now Jericho was securely shot because it was... Because of the children of Israel, none went out and none came in. Next verse. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hands. Now remember, you know, the Bible was not written in chapters and verses. So this is a continuation from chapter 5, right? Remember, it says, take off your shoes. And he removed your shoes. Because when he took off the shoes, he began to give him the instructions. He said, now, nah. says, and the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given you Jericho, I have given Jericho into your hands. It's king and the mighty. Notice, see, he didn't say, see, the Lord have given Jericho. He said, see, I have given Jericho into your hands. So go take it. Praise God. This was the appearance of the Lord. This was a manifestation of the Lord. Now, also, I didn't tell you, Abraham met a man called Melchizedek, right? He met a man called Melchizedek and he gave tithes to him, right? Now, Melchizedek, I think that's in Genesis chapter 14. Melchizedek was the appearance of God also. Now, in all these instances, like I told you, God didn't show up as the same person. Why? Why? Because they were all the appearances of the word of God made flesh. Are you getting what I'm saying? From Genesis, from the Garden of Eden to Abraham, Every appearance of God that you see in the Old Testament was the word of God, what? Made flesh. So God comes in flesh and shows up. He does his transactions and then he leaves, okay? He does his transactions and then he leaves. Now, the scripture these people use when they say there couldn't have been an appearance of God in the Old Testament. Now, all these things you have read, clear things you have read, right? Clear. It says, the Lord said. The Lord said. But then, those people that, they, they call themselves, so last scripture, or what was that word they use? They say, ah, if it's not clear in the word, give me John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And verse 18. John chapter 1, verse 18. Now, this is John speaking right, right here. He says, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. Now, 
He says, no one has what? Seen God at any time, right? Now, they say, the Bible says no one has seen God at any time. No, it's John that said it. Are you listening? It's John that said it. Now, I want to show you something. It's John that made this statement. And he made the same statement in 1 John chapter 4, verse 12. Give me 1 John chapter 4 and verse 12. I want to follow something now. 1 John 4, 12. No one has seen God at any time. Now, <clears throat> this 1 John is in the New Testament too. Are you following me? You know what I mean by the New Testament? Now, this is, this is him talking to people who are born again, people who have the Holy Ghost, right? He now, he now comes up and says, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love has been perfected in us. Now, what's John communicating here? John was communicating something. No one has seen God at any time. But if we love one another... We are what? Expressing God. That's what John was communicating. But I'll show you now where John got this statement. This thing he's saying. I'll show you where he got this from. Give me John chapter 6. Jesus himself said something. John chapter 6. John chapter 6 and verse 44. Verse 44. No one, no one can come to me except my father who sent me to him. Give me verse 45. Give me verse 46. Good. Watch this. I want us to read this together. I want to go. Not that anyone has seen the father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Now, this was the statement Jesus made that made John to be writing what he wrote, that no one has seen God at any time, right? But what did Jesus say? The, the original word of God now, I get what I'm saying. What did he say? Not that anyone has seen the Father. Now, there's a difference between no one has seen God and no one has seen the Father. Are you understand what I'm saying? Because the truth is this, no one will ever see the Father. But it doesn't mean God is hiding himself. Are you understand what I'm saying? It doesn't mean God is hiding himself, but no one can see the Father. In his real, because when you speak of the Father, you're talking about that one that is the Father of all. The, 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 the Ogak Pata Pata of them all. Are you getting what I'm saying? So, now, I want you to follow, follow something here. I'm going somewhere. So, Jesus made this statement. He says, not that anyone has seen the Father. Now, give me John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Are you following me? Are you enjoying this? Verse 8. John chapter 14 and verse 8. Philip said to him, Lord, Show us the Father, and it's sufficient for us. Look at what Jesus said next. Next verse. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not yet known me? Did you see that? Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me? He didn't say, what, did, what was the question? Show us the Father. And Jesus said, have I been so long with you and yet you have not known me? Okay? He who has seen me has seen... Talk to me. Has anyone seen the Father? Huh? Has anyone seen the Father? They asked him, show us the Father and we'll be good. He said, hey, have you been so long with me and yet you have not yet known me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how come? So how can you say, show us the Father? Meaning there is nothing else to see. But hey, was Jesus now talking about this himself that they were looking at? No, he wasn't. Because in a short while, he went to the cross. 
he died. And after he died, he rose from the dead. And you've heard me say this many times. The moment Jesus rose from the dead, all the times he appeared to his disciples, he appeared in different forms. Now that's why Philip, that's why Thomas doubted. Are you get what I'm saying? Are you get what I'm saying? All the times he appeared to them, what was Jesus doing? Remember, if you read John chapter 17, he was praying to the Father, right? Yet he says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. <laughs> So he was praying to the Father and he made a request. He says, Father, give me the glory that I had with you from the very beginning. What is that glory? The glory of the word of God. Not the skin, not the flesh. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's what he asked. So the moment he rose from the dead, he became who he really was before. The word of God made flesh. So now anytime he wants to visit the disciples, he comes in the way he wants to come. So the disciples were confused. They didn't know him again. Mary was by the tomb. And he, he approached her. And she saw him. She said, sir, please. I know in the book of that movie, he turned his back and he was wearing his shirt. So it now looked like she just didn't know. Uh -uh, no. She went to him face to face and said, please, sir. Uh, if you have taken him anywhere, can you just tell us, when he opened his mouth and called her name, Mary, she heard his voice. I said, Rabboni. She didn't say, uh, who are you? She responded to the voice. She didn't let the figure deceive her. She didn't let the figure make her doubt. She responded, teacher. That's the name she used to call him. He said, Hey, don't touch me. Go tell my disciples to meet you. And she ran. She didn't start asking him, why are you, why are you looking like an old man? <laughs> Remember, he was just like three years old. <laughs> why are you looking like an old man? You know, she didn't ask all those questions. She ran. I went to tell them, I saw him. You saw him? Yeah. Where is he? He said, you should meet him in this place. Ah, where is he? Is he looking healthy? I'm sure they would have asked those questions. Was he looking healthy? Yeah, but it's just that he was looking like an old. Please shut that door. You know, it's just that he's looking like an old man and like, like an old. Are you sure it's Jesus? You so? Are you sure it's not the gardener you're really talking about? <laughs> Say, no, he's the one. I know him. So one day, two disciples were walking to Emmaus. And he went to them, like a stranger, traveling like them too. I said, hey guys, where are you guys going to? Ah, we're going to Emmaus. Oh, I'm going in that direction too. Ah, what's going on? Why are your face looking like this? Ah, don't you know what's going on? See how they just killed Jesus. You know? See how they just killed Jesus. And then when they finished complaining and complaining and complaining, he said, but are these things not written? He began to teach them the scriptures, explaining about himself. And then they got to the house. Before they got to the house, they got to their junction. He said, oh, we're going this way. He said, oh, okay. No, no ah, come now, stay with us this night. They were enjoying the gist. And then he stayed with us. Oh, they brought food. He took bread and broke it. When he did that, they said, nah. That's when everything he has been saying hit them. They said, ah, he's the one. <laughs> and the moment they knew Jesus disappeared, he didn't stand up and leave. He disappeared. Are you listening to me? He disappeared. They couldn't stay that night again. They ran back, that very night, they ran back to Jerusalem <laughs> to tell the other disciples, guys, guess what? We saw him. You saw him. We walked with him from here. We didn't know, say, you guys, why are you talking like that? How can you say you don't know? You walked with him from this junction to this, you didn't know who you were talking to? No, sincerely. And that's the problem. His face was looking. And now compared with what Mary said, what are you, what's going on here? Now, Thomas was listening to all these gists. I said, you guys, you can't deceive me. See, I'm smart, I'm not a fool. So all these things people are describing, let me just say, let's settle it once and for all. 
except I see the hole in his hands and the hole in his side. Don't come and tell me anything. So, okay, you that saw it, did you see the hole? Did you see his hand? Um, I can't say who. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Did you? It was very cloth now, so I couldn't have seen his side. Nah, because I was there when they pierced him that spare. Ah, nah, nah. Even if that thing heals, there'll be a hole there. And because he said that, Jesus showed up while they were all in the room. And he said to them, he said to Thomas, he said, Thomas, come. Put your hand. He did. He says, put your hand here. He did. And he screamed, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, because you have seen, you believe. Blessed is he whom having not seen believes. Because why did he say that to him? Because this is how we're going to be operating from now. Do you know until the day Jesus ascended? Let me give you that scripture. Genesis chapter 28. <clears throat> Genesis 28. I'll end with this. Genesis 28 and verse 16. 16 and 17. Then, Gen uh, oh, sorry, Matthew, I said Genesis, <laughs> Matthew 28, Matthew, Matthew, Matthew 28. Then, watch this now, watch this. Then the 11 disciples, this was not the crowd, the 11, they could have been 12, you know what happened to Judas. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. Next verse. When they saw him, they worshipped him. Can we read the next three lines? 11. So even after what he did to Thomas, <laughs> it's not only Thomas that doubted. Now this is their last moment with him. And they showed up thinking he would be the old Jesus they know. Uh-uh. They got to the mountain. They saw somebody like, okay. Um, master, yeah, yes, uh, how are you guys? I'm sure they're pinching themselves. Are you sure? <laughs> See, they doubted. So even when Jesus was giving them the last instructions, so they were still wondering, hmm, hmm, Why? He can never operate in the same way he operated before he died. He is now living in his glory. I told you this last week. I said, don't imagine today that you will go to heaven and you will see Jesus. No. No. Don't think you will see him. And even if you see Peter in heaven, I said, Peter, where is Jesus? He said, don't worry, Jesus will come. And then somebody will show up. <laughs> I said, ah, Jesus has come. Yeah. Well, Peter, you were acting like you didn't know it. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Because he is now in that glory as the word of God. He is not a form. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He is not a form. There is no form. There is no figure. You can't describe him and think that is who he is. He will shock you. Because you may meet him today. Another person will tell you, I met Jesus. I said, okay, let's draw who we met. And you, you end up confusing yourselves. Why? Because we don't know him by face. We know him by his word. Are you hearing what I'm saying? From the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, the word of God came walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And that's why he doesn't show up physically even today. The same reason he did not show himself to Moses. You understand what I'm saying? But there are people who will walk with him. And he doesn't mind showing up to them. Knowing that they will not use it as a yardstick. So do you know what it is for Jesus to appear to me three, three times or 21 times? And everybody will now start entering fasting and prayer. Ah, Jesus, you can't appear to that pastor 21 times. And me, not even once. He's partial now. 
sorry it's not about him appearing what you want to do with his appearance meanwhile he's been with you he's been talking to you are you listening to what i'm saying so the question is did jesus appear in the old testament did god appear in the old testament yes he did he did people who say he did not appear they don't understand the scriptures they don't know him because they feel how can god that is a spirit appear as a man why is that impossible why is that impossible and those people don't know they don't know the glory of jesus they don't john on the island of patmos say he appeared to him he had to introduce himself to him this is john that used to lean on him <laughs> you understand what i'm saying this is john that used to lean on him this is john that saw him several times after he resurrected you know when they went back to fishing he came and says children do you have any meat he said no cast your net on the right side and then they did and john just told peter peter is the lord he says, yeah. he jumped into the river so john was quick to know him but yet in the island of patmos when he showed up john was looking and says i am he that was dead and yet i'm alive he had to introduce himself to that is the glory, that's the mystery of godliness. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So the same thing with you today. Don't be too concerned about the figure that you will see. Master his voice. Master his voice. That is his real self. His real self is not a figure. Though he can show up in figures. But his real self is not figure. Are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? First Timothy chapter 6, verse 14. We'll close with this. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 14. Maragado sebrete nege darakida haski. That you keep this commandment without spot, blemish, until the Lord Jesus Christ appearing. Next verse which he will manifest in his own time he who is the blessed and only potentate the king of kings and lord of lords uh -huh. who alone has immortality dwelling in unapproachable light whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Praise God. He's still telling you that even finally, it's still Jesus. Are you getting what I'm saying? It's still Jesus. So people will think that when we go to heaven, ah, I, 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 can't, I can't wait to go to heaven because I want to see God. And in your mind, you see one Baba on the throne with long beards and white hair, you know. Say, my children. I'm sorry to tell you this. You will not see. <laughs> I hear what I'm saying. You will not see. He doesn't sit down on the throne with the white, long beards. No. His throne is light. Unapproachable light. So the part he lets us see is his manifested part. But that manifested part is him. Can you understand what I'm saying? It's him. Stand up on your feet. Why am I sharing this with you? So you will know him. Not have a misconception about him. He is the Lord. And guess what? He visits us. It's not only Abraham he loves to visit. He loves you too. He loves you. And this is what makes men know that he is real. He is real. And he wants you to relate with him like he's real. And trust him. Trust him. Jesus can visit you. It's not a problem to him. But see, I'm, I'm setting your minds right. 
when he visits you it's not so that you will catch an image in your mind when he visits you it is his word is coming to give you if you look for the image and you miss the word you've missed him but if you open your heart and let him always speak to you and enjoy and love him for who he is he is the word of god lift up your hands and say lord i welcome you i welcome you i recognize you as my lord every day of my life i know you have great plans for me and i ask you tonight there is no way any man can know you until you reveal yourself to him please reveal yourself to me i don't want to claim that i know you fully yet that's why i ask that you reveal yourself there are many many things about you i don't know you love to exercise loving kindness you love to exercise judgment. You love to exercise righteousness. Reveal yourself to me, Lord. Help me exercise loving kindness like you. Help me exercise judgment like you. Help me exercise righteousness like you. That I will represent you on the earth. Let men know you when they meet me thank you lord jesus just give him praise 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 give him praise